In a secluded jungle location close to Myanmar's border with Thailand, a group of journalists met this past August for several weeks of training. They had travelled there from across the country, from regions under the authority of Myanmar's military junta, as well as those controlled by rebel resistance forces. The training programme is run by Myanmar's largest independent news outlet, Mizima. It aims to equip students with the skills they'll need to do their jobs in one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a reporter. This training school is in Karen State, an area controlled by revolutionary ethnic armed groups. We couldn't even dream of opening such a media institute in military controlled areas. We want to generate a new generation of journalists. There are less of us since the coup. The students are from all over Myanmar, and when they finish, they will take this knowledge back to their hometowns. I was an average student before the coup. I didn't know much about journalism. I became a journalist only after the coup. When I heard that Mizima was running this training, I thought it would support my work. I've learned how to write stories, I've learned how to verify news. They also taught me how to question the government officer in my state, which is really useful. And all this training is happening with a diverse group of different ages and ethnicities. People I can learn from. Life for journalists in Myanmar was turned upside down in February 2021, when a military coup abruptly ended the country's decade-long experiment with democracy. The night before the coup, the generals plotted a media blackout. They unplugged Mizima TV and another channel, DVD, from the country's terrestrial TV carrier. After the coup was announced on February 1st, Mizima's journalists, like many others, went into hiding. After thousands of people across Myanmar came out to resist the military, phones in hand, the generals began implementing an information and internet blackout. What the hunter had not accounted for was the level of pushback they would receive from citizens and journalists. The military ordered the media not to use the word coup, but journalists asserted that a coup is a coup and continued using that terminology. The military did not expect such a response. They tried to stop this by cutting off internet access, banning Facebook and shutting down the media. They took drastic measures like closing down bank accounts. Such actions are typically associated with authoritarian regimes like North Korea or Russia. The military believed that these measures would intimidate the population, but they underestimated both the resilience of the youth and the power of the media, which prevented the military from controlling the narrative. I wrote editorials using the term coup. I didn't want to lie to the nation. The coup is illegal. It needed to be said. That's our job. As journalists, we had to consider whether we should leave the country or relocate to somewhere not under the control of the military. We expected our office would be raided, so everything important had been moved. When they got there, they found nothing, but they sealed off the office. After that, we asked our journalists to relocate either to liberated areas or neighbouring countries. Some resigned. We didn't blame them. The work of journalism became a crime. We had to start from scratch. We didn't have editors. We didn't have an office. We went into the jungle and had no internet, no electricity. Seven of our journalists, including Mizima's co-founder, Dao Tindin Aung, were arrested. One of them was brutally tortured and one person is still in prison. Anyone involved with Mizima can be indicted for working with us. At a minimum, they could face two to three years imprisonment. Their families and friends are also at risk. Shortly after the coup, we stopped including bylines with journalists' real identities and started using pseudonyms. And we cut any connections between journalists operating underground in Yangon and those elsewhere in the country. That way, if one journalist is apprehended, they won't be able to disclose any links with the other. Media workers face considerable risks if caught by the military. Many have been imprisoned under sweeping anti-state and false news laws, and at least three journalists have been killed while in the army's custody. 
It's part of what the UN has called a scorched earth policy against the unprecedented wave of opposition the junta faces across the country. Over the past year, the military has suffered a series of defeats and lost huge swathes of territory to ethnic armed resistance groups. It's now thought the junta controls less than 100 of Myanmar's 330 townships. Thousands have been killed and millions displaced in the fighting. There is a sense that the balance of power is shifting in favor of Myanmar's ethnic minorities in ways that will be difficult for the military to undo. Under pressure, the generals have resorted to a time-worn tactic of ethno-nationalist messaging to try to shore up support among the Burman majority, crude narratives that are delivered in sophisticated ways. The architect of this psychological warfare project is Colonel Zhuo Zhojie. He got a PhD from a Russian university and he's smart. His unit is very organized and very good at technology. You see their presence mainly on Telegram and X. We monitored more than 180 Telegram channels. They create messaging that non-Buddhist religions are dangerous, Muslims are dangerous, Christians are dangerous, that they are doing a defensive war to protect Buddhism from other ethnic groups. So they use propaganda based on maintaining the Burma ethnic identity to cover up their atrocities. There are telegram channels like Kote and Shweneja that distribute so much propaganda from the military. They'll never post about the violations of the military, only good things. The problem is, many people have subscribed to those telegram channels and many people like them. The Myanmar military is acting like any dictatorship would. However, they now have more tools at their disposal. Technology they've obtained from China to block VPNs, monitoring software and CCTV for surveillance. They spread misinformation very enthusiastically. This reflects their belief that if they spread enough falsehoods, those lies may eventually be accepted as truth. A similar thing happened after Egypt's military coup. By creating uncertainty, the military can claim that they are the only ones capable of solving problems and protecting the country. One reason the military's propaganda has not proven decisive in Myanmar is because of a young generation that is more tech-savvy and better informed. News outlets like Mizima have also played their role. Mizima's evolution over the years has tracked the country's tumultuous history with military rule. The outlet was founded in exile in 1998 with bases in India and Thailand. It has grown from a news service that operated on fax machines to a network with more than 20 platforms. In 2011, when a democratic transition began in Myanmar, the two men leading Mizima, So Min and Sein Win, who are brothers, took the decision to return home. Now they find themselves back where they started, reporting either covertly in Myanmar or in exile from neighboring countries. I learned many lessons from my life. In Buddhism, it is taught that nothing is permanent. In this ever-changing world, we must be innovative to move forward. I believe that struggling against what is wrong can lead to victory and pave the way for positive change. We had a taste of democracy that lasted only a few years, so we must make twice the effort to achieve lasting change. The dictatorship will eventually fall, but we need to prepare in advance for what comes after. Mizima's mission is also part of the nation-building process. No matter what role we play, we want to collaborate and be involved in this journey together.